Hi, listeners, and those of you that may be you want to create your own podcast. I need to tell you about a platform that I use and one of my favorite podcasts, Be the Bridge with Latasha Morrison uses, is Anchor. Anchor FM is free, totally free. It's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And then it does the heavy lifting for you. You can distribute your pot, it distributes your podcast so you can be heard on places like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So if you're interested in making your own podcast, I highly encourage you to download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's the way I did it. It's the way that Latasha Morrison with Build the Bridge did it. And it's the way many of the podcasts that I listen to do it. Go to anchor.fm. You won't regret it. Welcome. You're listening to the Bulldog Educator Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Kirsten Wilson. Thank you so much for listening. Music created for the Bulldog Educator is by David Galvez. Podcast platform is through anchor.fm. Welcome to the Bulldog Educator Podcast. This is episode 16 of season one, discussing the UDL guidelines in regards to access. You're probably wondering whose voice this is, and as it isn't our podcast host, Kirsten, this is a special episode. I'm Rainbow Bagsby, a friend and colleague of Kirsten's. She has asked me to be a guest on the podcast and interview her regarding the topic of UDL guidelines in relation to the area of access. We appreciate you all listening as we share more about this tried and true evidence-based framework for optimizing learning. Kirsten, how does it feel to be on the other side of the mic? It's a little strange, but I am super excited to share about this topic. Well, with that said, let's get started. What are we going to be talking about today in regards to the UDL guidelines? I am so glad you asked, Rainbow. There are so many aspects of the Universal Design for Learning guidelines to consider. However, if you look at the infographic that's provided through the um, through CAST, through udlguidelines.cast.org, the columns address multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action expression. These columns are not in isolation of one another, and it's presented in such a way that you can move down the columns and across the rows, which the rows is what I'll be talking about today, specifically the top row, access. They all work together to help our students become expert learners. If you go to the bottom of an infographic on the last row, that's the fourth row, it's identified as goal, expert learner. To get there, there are things that must happen from the role of the educator, the school um, or learning organization, and the role of the learner. So in addition to the columns I mentioned before with multiple means of engagement, representation, and action expression, there are rows rows that build upon one another starting with access, then to build, and finally internalize. Today, I'm going to focus on the first row, access. Does that mean that it must be sequentially follow from access to build to internalize in order for the UDL guidelines that are implemented or practiced to be effective? Not at all. There are some parts of each row that I believe it is harder for the learner to move to the next row progress-wise. If those elements aren't present, present. But I also know that a learner can progress in their absence. It is just important to know the progression to ensure that barriers, both visible and invisible, have been eliminated as best as we can possibly do. However, if there is something that is easy to address in the UDL guidelines that's further in the progression, don't hold back. Go for it. You mentioned that you were planning to talk about the first row regarding access. Yes. Good point. Let's get back on track. Often the most prohibitive issue in learning barriers is both visible and invisible that limit a learner's ability to grab hold of the learning. So let's break this down. There are three areas in access. The first under the column of multiple means of engagement. The second under the column of multiple means of representation. And the third under the multiple means of action and expression. At this level, access 
There is a heavier emphasis on, emphasis on teacher and organization's delivery environment and learning and less on the student. So to make things a little easier for the listener, let's break it down into three different areas under the multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression in regards to the row access. Talk to me about how access and multiple means of engagement intersect. Yeah, so in this particular area, it's identified as providing options for recruiting interest. In this section, as it states in the CAST website, um, it says, information that is not attended to, that does not engage learners' cognition, is in fact inaccessible. It is inaccessible both in the moment and in the future because relevant information goes unnoticed and unprocessed. As a result, teachers devote considerable effort to recruiting learner attention and engagement, but learners differ significantly in what attracts their attention and engages their interest. Even the same learner will differ over time and circumstance. Their interests change as they develop and gain new knowledge and skills, as their biological environments change, and as they develop into self-determined adolescents and adults. It is therefore important to have alternative ways to recruit learner interest, ways that reflect, reflect the important inter- and intra-individual differences amongst learners. So in addition to addressing attention and interest, what else does this area address? Well, there are checkpoints. These checkpoints go into three areas. The first is optimizing individual choice and autonomy, taking into consideration how we empower learners to take charge of their own learning. Also, another checkpoint is optimizing relevance, value, and authenticity. This is where educators seek to connect learning to experiences that are relevant and meaningful to the learner. The final checkpoint is minimizing threats and distractions, which involves purposefully fostering a safe space for learning and for students to take risk with their learning. The crazy thing about all of these checkpoints is many of us are really actually already naturally doing many of these things. UDL just helps in, us in regards to access in the area of multiple means of engagement to have an intentional check to ensure that it is happening not by accident, accident, but intentionally in all of our practices. You mentioned that was the first area in access with multiple means of engagement where we are providing options for recruiting interest. So if I follow you, the next area is in the area of multiple means of representation. What is the focus there? Yes, you really are following along. And so moving to that, under multiple means of representation, this is where, um, where in access we provide options for perception. This is where CAS states, learning is impossible if information is imperceptible to the learner and difficult when information is presented in formats that require extraordinary effort or assistance. To reduce barriers to learning, it is important to ensure that key information is equally perceptible by all learners by, one, providing the same information through different modalities, for example, through vision, hearing, or touch, two, providing information in a format that will allow for adjustability by the user, for example, text that can be enlarged, sounds that can be amplifi amplified. Such multiple representations not only ensure that information is accessible to learners with particularly sensory and perceptible disabilities, but it is also easier to access and comprehend for many others. If you want more information on this, you can actually go to that website I mentioned before, udlguidelines.cast.org, and in this particular area, check under the tab of representation and then the uh, drop-down menu to perception. In this area, it is extremely important that anyone publishing online curriculum or content for the purposes of learning be familiar and apply the web content accessibility guidelines as well. This is important in face-to-face -face, um, instructional environments also. Presenting contact, um, content with multiple ways for a learner to access is extremely important. Often your special education specialist at your school or local education service cooperative can help you know what types of accessibility tools are available for you to implement. One misunderstanding many educators have that it is that there should only, they should only be concerned with accessibility when there's specific visible need. Universal Design for Learning is designed to guide the delivery of learning so that barriers both visible and invisible are anticipated and addressed 
so that there is no need to amend or change delivery and approach because of a student. Thank you for that clarification. To further examine, provide options for perception. What are the checkpoints for this area? Yes, this is where I highly re recommend an educator have a team or a network of collaborative support. I know for me, this has been important. In this area, the first checkpoint is to display information in a flexible format so that perceptual, so perceptual features can be varied. These perceptual features include size of text, images, graphs, tables, or other visual contact content. This also can be contrast between background and the text or image, color used for information or emphasis, volume or rate of speech or sound, speed or timing of the video, animation, sound or simulations, etc. The layout of visual or other em um, elements the, and the font used for print materials. What many aren't aware is that varied ways of representation doesn't mean bells and whistles and flashing lights or being highly entertaining. What it does mean is the font is readable to those with vision challenges. This includes fonts that can be less accessible to dys, uh, dyslexic, excuse me, dyslexic learners. Often cute fonts or colorful images can be barriers to students being able to access the actual learning which seems to fly in the face of a lot of us understanding the um, part of UDL about being engaging. I know when I first learned about accessibility from the lens of UDL and online accessibility standards, I realized how many times by, make, um, by making my content what I thought in my mind was engaging was actually creating invisible barriers for my students to access learning. As I mentioned before, this is where you may want to use your colleagues to do a quick review of your content to ensure that it meets the criteria mentioned before and the delivery doesn't have any unintended barriers for learners. The next checkpoint with options for perception includes providing alternatives for auditory for information. Just like displaying information in a flexible format, providing formats that support those that may face challenges with auditory formats, many of us automatically think of those with hearing loss or living with an inability to hear at all is what this is intended for, and it is. However, this can also be a consideration for those that are in environments where captioning is the only option for playing audio um, because audio may not be allowed um, where others can hear. For those that prefer and recognize um, that option, having that option other than audio may be how they best learn, and this approach supports that as well. Finally, the third checkpoint addresses offering alternatives for visual presentation. In this checkpoint for options for perception, the focus is on offering information in more ways than visual or text alone. This is where screen readers, video, and podcasts like the format we're currently presenting in can be a valuable format for presenting learning. This includes understanding, following accessibility standards for text and formatting pre presentation to account for visual difficulties. Again, relying on colleagues to help review content both being present, presented analog or through digital is recommended. Wow, that's a lot of information and seems a bit overwhelming. What do you suggest to approach implementing the UDL guidelines in the area of options with perception? That is a super great question and you know as I was sharing it I kind of got myself overwhelmed all over again even though I'm very familiar with it and work with it every day. But what I would recommend is that you seek books to become more knowledgeable in this area like UDL in the Cloud by Katie Novak and Ted Thibodeau and the UDL Lesson Planner by Ralebate. The CAST site that I mentioned e earlier is also a great resource. I would um, suggest learning what you can as and then as you learn, adjust your presentation of the instruction. The other is to employ the idea of collaboration, just like I mentioned before. Have your team join you in the efforts to adapt the content to meet the UDL guidelines together, each taking a part of the process and working together to adapt the content. Most of all, don't try to take it all on at once. Do what you can with what you have and just go working toward getting to a point where it's done like second nature. I have this saying that I like to say is, how do you eat an elephant? You don't eat it all at once. You eat it one bite at a time. So take it one bite at a time. It just takes time and a certain amount of growth and understanding and how it works. Just be patient, 
be forgiving, give yourself grace, and just work with your um, colleagues and yourself to accomplish it. That is helpful. And yes, working with the team is much better than doing it alone. My next question, where are we now with the access part of the UDL guidelines? Well, we've talked about multiple means of engagement. We've talked about a multiple means of representation in this section of access. Now we're moving to multiple means of expression and action. Here we are discussing how we provide options for physical action. CAS states, a textbook or a workbook in a print format provides limited means of navigation or physical interaction. For example, turning pages or handwriting in spaces provided. Many interactive places of educational software simply similarly provide only limited means of navigation or interaction. For example, using a joystick or requiring the use of a keyboard. Navigation and interaction in those limited ways will raise barriers for some learners. Those with physical disabilities, blindness, dysgraphia, or who need various kinds of executive functioning support. It's important to provide materials which all learners can interact. Properly designed curricular materials provide a seamless interface with common assistive technologies through which individuals with movement impairments can navigate and express what they know to allow navigation or interaction with a single switch through voice activated switches, expanded keyboards, and others. This means that we just must find a way to vary the methods for response and navigation, and we must also optimize access to tools and assistive technologies that are available to learners of all abilities without the need for additional supports outside of their own reach. At this point, we've covered a lot in just the area of access with the UDL guidelines. Is there anything you would like to add or to share with our listeners? Yes, I'm so glad you asked because I was thinking about this as I was talking that I wanted to go back to the first area where we discussed the options for recruiting interest. I want to clarify here that in this area, it isn't just doing things that kids are interested in learning about, but developing an environment built on relationships and providing guided choice with learning situations. This is as simple as providing an opportunity for how students respond to an open-ended question providing a, um, a project with a well-written rubric and a few choices and how they can meet that rubric expectations. Those are just a couple of examples. And speaking of rubrics, I am super excited because in the next episode, I'm going to be interviewing you on the ways we can utilize rubrics to address recruiting interest through individual choice and autonomy, optimizing relevance, value, and authenticity, as well as some of the other aspects of UDL. I want to... Uh, Thank you for being willing to interview me for the Bulldog Educator Rainbow. We're looking forward to exploring more aspects of the universal design for learning over the next few months. And as always, listeners, please share with us your thoughts, questions, and ideas. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to interview you. I am ready to be the one being interviewed instead. Thank you, listeners, for being patient with me as your guest. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Bulldog Educator, hosted by yours truly, Kirsten Wilson. You can find The Bulldog Educator on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using the handle at thebulldog.edu. That's at thebulldog.edu. You can also find us and content related to education and this podcast on our blog at thebulldog.edu.org.